Thanks. Hello and welcome to this episode of The Psychology of Almost Everything. My name is Peter Thompson. And my name is Stuart Grant. I'm delighted to welcome Dr Anne Patterson, consultant psychiatrist as well as a psychoanalyst. Anne, welcome. Thank you very much. And I wonder if we could kick off by asking for the sake of our listeners really who uh, may not know the difference between psychiatry, psychoanalysis, psychotherapy, CBT, counselling and so on. Can you give us just a brief rundown of the, of the differences say between psychoanalysis and, and general psychiatry? Well, I suppose, first of all, to be a psychiatrist, you have to start with the medical training and then you specialise in psychiatry. And then if you want to be a medical psychotherapist, you then further specialise in psychotherapy. But the key thing is psychiatrists are all medical doctors. Uh -huh. If we're talking about psychoanalysis, particularly in this country and now throughout the world, but it's really interesting it didn't start like that, then... All you have to do to be a psychoanalyst is have a psychoanalytic training. You can have any sort of previous career, any sort of degree in order to do that. You don't have to be a doctor, you don't have to be a psychologist. And in fact, Freud wrote about this um, in The Question of Lay Analysis, where he argues very clearly that people who are not doctors actually make better psychoanalysts than those who are. <laughs> you said it didn't start like that. Well, how did it start? I think I was a bit mistaken there. It did start like that. <laughs> it started... With Freud. It started with Freud, who was a medical doctor. Yes, and a neurologist. And a neurologist, who in fact, really, in his first kind of big work, the Project for a Scientific Psychology, actually wanted to have a kind of scientific take on the mind and on psychology. He was very much influenced by Charcot in Paris, who was working on hysteria at the time. And... When he started, most of the people who trained with him were actually doctors, but there were always people who weren't, and he thought that was a good idea. Oh, did he? Because I was wondering yes. if there's a resistance amongst doctors for people who weren't medically trained coming in and sort of colonising the profession. Not originally. Mm -hmm. Where there was a, a initially um, resistance was in the United States, because there psychoanalysis very quickly became associated with medical professionals uh -huh. and for a long time if you wanted to be an analyst you'd have to go to medical school do psychiatry and then be able to study psychoanalysis but Freud was very much against this and this is one of the reasons he wrote a question of lay analysis. May I just ask you you're saying that uh, in effect anybody could be a psychoanalyst, as long as they've done the psychoanalytic training. Can you tell us about what psychoanalytic training involves? I'm going to talk particularly about the training that I did, because yeah. I think that's mm. yeah, know, be most relevant, yeah, right. yeah. which was at the British Psychoanalytical Society. And the training there comprises five times a week psychoanalysis yourself. So you, as the aspiring analyst, have to be a patient. And I think there's all sorts of really important reasons why that's a good thing. Uh -huh. So you have your own psychoanalysis and you attend seminar courses about the theory of psychoanalysis. You then start seeing patients and you have two patients who you see five times a week with supervision. And you have clinical seminars as well where there's a group who discusses the supervision. And this can go last anything from, well, three years. That's the absolute fastest you could do it. Most people take five. Some people take longer. But it's, as you can imagine, a very intensive training. Can I, sorry to interrupt, but you're telling us, I mean, it does sound intensive, and you would be doing this alongside your work as a psychiatrist. Your day job. Your day job, as it were. That's what I did, although wow. I, I, not everybody does. I had a part-time consultant psychiatry post uh -huh. specialising in psychotherapy, which helped a bit. Right. And you have to pay for this analysis, don't yes. you? Yes. So you have to be quite resourceful to pay for a five times a week analysis. Are there fees to the Institute of... There are, but um, certainly in the training that I did at the Institute of Psychoanalysis, British Psychoanalytical Society, the seminar fees are extremely low compared with many other courses and the seminar leaders generally work for nothing. Um, so it's a kind of giving back uh -huh. um, to the institution that trained you. 
and the major expenses in, in paying for your own analysis. Some other courses, maybe that don't demand such frequent analysis, might have the course fees are much more expensive. But it is, it is a significant cost, but I think how I would describe it as well is that it's a significant investment because your personal analysis is such an opportunity to develop, to know yourself and to change your life. Along those lines, do you think that clinical psychologists should have psychotherapy whilst they're doing their training as well? Well, personally, I think it would be really helpful for mm -hmm. them. I think it would be really helpful for trainee psychiatrists as well. And in fact, many young psychiatrists do have some psychotherapy. They don't always manage to have a full analysis, i.e. the five times a week, because of the time and all their shifts and everything. But I think it would be helpful, as I say, both for psychiatrists and psychologists. I take it at the moment, though, that's not a requirement of no. their medical training, is it? No. No. The and only people for whom it is a requirement are those who are doing a, a sort of specialist medical psychotherapy sure, training. Sure, And you've told us about a distinction between uh, clinical psychology and psychoanalysis, and you've told us about how psychoanalysts train. I wonder if you could tell us about the differences between psychiatry itself and psychoanalysis, and then if you could go on to say any differences between psychoanalysis and cognitive behaviour therapy, which I think many of our listeners will have, will have heard of. I suppose I would start by saying that, again, because psychiatry is within a medical mm -hmm. discipline, it follows what has always been called the medical model, which is a sort of biopsychosocial view of the patient and their particular difficulties or dilemmas. Sometimes it's been accused, psychiatry that is, of veering a little bit too much towards the bio bit, that is looking at all the sort of difficulties that people have as sort of chemical imbalances, etc., mm -hmm. that can be corrected by giving other chemicals, for example, antidepressants or antipsychotics. The true medical model isn't like that, though, and any good formulation of, of a patient's difficulties does include a psychological and a social perspective. Being a bit simplistic, I would say that we take the, the psychological perspective and that's, the, that's what we amplify into, into a more psychoanalytic approach. But psychoanalysis, I think, can be characterised or differentiated from something like cognitive behavioural therapy and many of the other offshoots of psychotherapy, psychoanalysis in that there are, there are about, I would say, three main things. First of all, it's, it's founded on Freud's um, elaboration of the unconscious mind. That's the first thing. Secondly, the relationship between the psychoanalyst and their patient is absolutely key in the treatment and in the kind of curative factors. And I can say a little bit more about that later if you like. And thirdly, there is a very particular setting. So this is in intensive psychoanalysis, the five times a week, that the patient lies on the couch. And also that there is no agenda. There's no plan except there is a 50 minute session in, in the UK. In France, it's 45 minutes. <laughs> um, and within those 50 minutes, anything can happen. And that's it. Whereas something like uh, cognitive behaviour therapy, I don't think theorises the idea of an unconscious mind particularly, although it's been a little bit developed more recently, I think, with sort of unconscious um, schema, mm -hmm. which I think is interesting because I think it's veering back towards psychoanalysis again. I'm sure I'll be shot by the cognitive behavioural therapist <laughs> for saying that. But anyway, um, because of course... Cognitive behaviour therapy and um, systemic or family therapy all were developed by psychoanalysts who felt that the in-depth psychoanalytic model was perhaps not very helpful for certain patients or took too long, and so they developed something else. But of course people can develop from one body of knowledge, differentiate themselves and then return a bit. So there is a very definite process in psychoanalysis and it's as if that process facilitates symptom removal, or getting better, or is it about exploring your unconscious, or is it all those things? 
Well, Freud, I think, said something like the aim of psychoanalysis was to turn neurotic misery into everyday unhappiness. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. That's facing reality, isn't it? That's about exactly. something facing reality. It's about facing reality. And he also delineated these two particular areas of satisfaction, if you like, both love and work. And I suppose if you look at all our developments, these are sort of, you know, pretty major areas where we can kind of succeed, fail and something in between and, and have difficulties. Other people have talked about the importance of knowing themselves better which doesn't necessarily remove symptoms. It's just that you kind of recognise them and they come along and kind of smack you in the face again. Freud also said that it was about making the unconscious conscious. Um, but again, that's the sort of idea of knowing yourself. Mm. Um, mm. You said reality. earlier that within that consulting room, the patient comes in and lies down for 50 minutes, anything goes or anything happens. I mean, presumably there are some boundaries, aren't there? I mean, it's going to start on time, end on time. There's That's not going the to be physical contact. That's correct. So you could talk about anything you like, absolutely anything. Are there any other boundaries at all, restrictions that are put on this? I suppose you wouldn't expect that, I mean, yes, you have the boundary within which you can talk about whatever you like. There is a boundary and a barrier, physical contact. Um, and in fact, in this country, Mostly, psychoanalysts don't shake hands with their patients. In some countries they do, because that's much more the culture. And I believe in, 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 in other cultures, people even, you know, have the very sort of formal hello and goodbye kiss. But, mm -hmm. you know... As you're in France, for example, you might or some, cheek. I think the French shake hands. Okay. I think sometimes in South America it's a sort of kiss on the cheek. But in this country, you normally say hello or good morning or something like that, and that's it. I, I hesitate to say that there's no sort of physical things that happen because sometimes if a patient wants to get up and walk around the room, they'll get up and walk around the room. I think obviously there, there's a, a boundary about violence and destructiveness. Mm -hmm. You know, if somebody's going to hurt themselves or mm -hmm. hurt you, then you're going to have to intervene. Mm -hmm. But I think it's the idea that you have no plan. You do not know what someone's going to come in and say. And what's even better is if when you as the patient don't know what you're going to come in and say. That's very different, as you said, from CBT, isn't it, where an agenda is always set. There are very clear goals. The thing is about reducing the person's symptoms and problems. A lot, lot of the work goes on in between sessions with homework tasks yes. and so on. It's, it's and there are boundaries in CVT Oh, well, of course well. there's boundaries mm. in CVT. Absolutely. And, and, and I would say also the, the uh, client-therapist relationship is very powerful in CBT as well. I mean, as it would be, wouldn't it? For, for any kind of human interaction, you're going to be much more inclined to take your the advice or do the homework from your CBT therapist if there's a relationship there, yeah? And you've mentioned Freud. <clears throat> Are there schools or different schools of thoughts within the British Psychoanalytical Society? Yes, there are. Of course, they're all based on Freud, and that's important. But there are, I suppose, three traditions. There's the Freudian tradition, now the contemporary Freudians, the independents, and the Kleinians. I, mean, I was thinking, if you're a listener going into psychoanalysis, you're probably not going to be really aware of much difference, are you? Wow. The technique is the same, the 50-minute hour, the, the lying on the couch, hour. the talking about what's going on in the your free dreams, association. And the free association. It would be much the same, I would have thought. Yes, I think that's right. And the free association is very much this idea of just saying what comes to mind, which of course is very difficult. It's a bit like saying be spontaneous. <laughs> but I think there is an idea that you just let yourself kind of go where, wherever um, the thoughts take you, rather than maybe, you know, you've got a, a kind of list of things, the homework that mm. you were talking yes, about sure. in cognitive yeah. therapy. And the agenda, yeah. And the agenda. Yeah, yeah. I think you would find much more in common with any British psychoanalyst than, say, compared with a different sort of psychotherapy. Sure. Yeah. A psychoanalyst I spoke to some years back was talking about this and he was telling me that there are three schools, the contemporary Freudians, the Kleinians, and the independents, and then he said, there's a fourth school, and that's the partners of the analysts <laughs> <laughs> who, who are at home. And because I was going, thinking back to the statement I made earlier about this is a hugely demanding training, and the work itself happens during out of hours, early in the morning, or maybe 
between, say, five, six, seven into the evening. Is that how it works? Most of the time, I think. But there <coughs> are also people, particularly these days, where people have more flexible working patterns, where, where they can come during the day. Or if they're, say, doing a training and it's part of their job almost, then they can come sometimes during the day. But I think a lot of people do still either do early mornings, maybe lunch times and evenings. Um, some people do both, some people do one or another. Because I was thinking, Stuart, about some of the patients we've worked with over the years who would be, say, coming for shorter therapy, Absolutely. often aren't employed at the time. I mean, mm -hmm. they're, they're really quite broken down and they wouldn't have the resources to have five mm -hmm. times a week analysis. Can I, can, there, there will be a parallel though with clients we saw as psych, psychologists. Now I'm going to ask you this question and I'm very, very conscious of the whole issue of confidentiality. So I don't want you to say, well I know you wouldn't say anything about uh, any of your patients or clients, but I wonder if you could give us an idea of the sort of problems that people bring to psychoanalysis. I would say that they bring the problems of everyday life, really. Mm -hmm. Depression, loss, trauma, existential crisis. You know, who am mm -hmm. I? What am I doing? What's the meaning of my life? Mm -hmm. And I think increasingly, mm -hmm. uh, whereas Freud saw hyster hysterical patients mm -hmm. or uh, more neurotic patients, mm -hmm. obsessional patients, anxious patients, more and more people, and I think it's also because the analysis is much longer now, more and more I think people bring more existential problems. And I think maybe there is a different culture now as well with maybe the, I don't know, what could you say, the, the fact that religion is less dominant maybe and people don't have such a, a kind of traditional view of what the meaning of their lives might be. I think that it does face people with those very difficult existential questions. And you, I know you do some teaching, you teach mm. uh, doctors, don't you, and psychiatrists? I used to, I okay. used to, yes. Could you give us some insight into that? What do you teach them? Well, I mean, I did lots of teaching for trainee psychiatrists, really on the fundamentals of psychoanalysis. So very much the sort of thing I was talking about earlier, about the importance of the unconscious, and the doctor-patient relationship, the way that we consider that the earliest experiences that someone has form a sort of template in their minds of what a relationship is like. And of course it kind of gets a bit distorted by, by our own experience of it because we all make something different out of every experience. It's not just, oh, well, someone says, you know, my mother was like that, and they definitely are. Um, but that's what they made of the experience. Anyway, this is kind of first edition, if you like. This is what mm. Freud called it, this is first edition. But then this sort of template gets reworked and re-elaborated in, in other relationships. And the hope is that you get some idea of what this very early template is like in the doctor-patient relationship in the analysis. Is this transference you're talking yes. about here? Mm -hmm. right. So basically there is a transference of our early mm -hmm. relationships into our current relationships. Mm -hmm. And so, that's why it's called transference. Right. So, you know, if, for instance, you've had fairly good exper early experiences and, you know, that's very much your template, then you might be quite trusting, etc., etc. Mm -hmm. So I teach them about the doctor-patient relationship and I taught about all sorts of things like depression but again taking a psychoanalytic view of depression which is all about mourning and being able to give up and accept loss or resisting it which is more like a depressive refusal to accept it psychosis all sorts of any kind of psychiatric concept we could talk about from a psychoanalytic perspective um, really try to help them develop their own capacities I mean, the other thing that's interesting is that in general psychiatric training, all trainees uh, have to participate in a balanced group. They are groups that focus on the dynamics of the doctor-patient relationship. Michael Balint was a Hungarian psychoanalyst and medical doctor who came over to the UK in, I think, the 1950s with his wife. They took a real interest in GPs and their practice and particularly in the so-called heart sink patients who keep coming back and coming back and the GP doesn't know what on earth they're doing and really struggles 
with them. And so they formed this method of having a group. And so the GPs would all get would meet together maybe once a week or once a month with Ballant um, and perhaps another facilitator. And they would talk about the difficult case. And it's really evolved into a, a particular sort of method of investigating what is going on in the, the specifics of a doctor-patient relationship. So it's this doctor and this patient in this episode that's being described. And it's really trying to get at the unconscious dynamics, what might really be going on at an unconscious level. Mm -hmm. And various different ways of doing balance groups have evolved, but there is a balance society in the UK that offers training for people, and all junior psychiatrists have to go to these groups. And so that's a kind of real first-hand way of experiencing something of the exploration of the unconscious dynamics. And I know you've been involved in the Psychoanalytical Film Festival. I was wondering if you could tell the listeners a bit more about that. When did it start? What are your plans for the future of film festivals? You... I've done a little bit of research on this, so I'm, oh, okay. I, I'm I really, I would really, I really want to ask this question, okay? So in the 1890s, Freud publishes his first book, I think on aphasia. But also in the 1890s, the first commercial film is ever shown by the Luminaire Brothers, I think in about 1895 or something in Paris. So my question, well, it's Peter's question, but I'm going to nick it, is did Freud go to the pictures? <laughs> <laughs> well, I don't know if he went to the pictures, <laughs> but it is interesting, isn't it, that the psychoanalysis and the cinema are they, often said to, to be yeah. born at the same exactly, time. Exactly, exactly. Yeah. Um, and in fact, a lot of people were, um, who were making films were really interested in, in the psychoanalysis mm -hmm. and Freud's ideas. Freud really didn't want anything to do with it. Oh and he considered that, you know, the movies, he said, you know, it was something, he made some comparison with all these other modern trends like bobbed hair. And I think he saw kind of the movies as a bit of this kind of American invention. Mm -hmm. There was a bit of an upstart, really. And he was asked to be involved in making several films about psychoanalysis, the psychoanalytic process. And he refused. So that is interesting. And I don't know whether he actually ever got converted to going to the movies. <laughs> Tell us about the forthcoming film festival. Well, it's um, going to be next November. That's November 2024 in London, in person. Like the last one, it's going to be at the Royal Society of Medicine. And That's in Wimpole Street. Wimpole isn't it? Street, yeah. very central. And the theme is Journey. Any films lined up yet, or is that a well, secret? it's a secret. It's a secret. That's okay, a secret. well, what won't be a secret, which I'm just dying to know, is what films have you shown in the past? At the film festival? Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's, I think it's really important to say the European Psycholytic Film Festival has been going for probably like about 25 years, but wow. it was started by Andrea Sabadini. Here in London. Here in London, and he ran... It was. It's every other year, and he ran... 10 festivals and then around the pandemic before the pandemic he decided that 10 was enough and so he stopped and a colleague and friend of mine Kathleen Lanzi and I became the co-directors and so we have only done one festival before that was last time and we're planning the next one now and at the last festival which was on the theme of hope well, we showed quite a few different sorts of films. We get films from all over Europe. We want films that generally haven't been seen before. Although our gala film was a British film called Ali and Ava. And it's a film that was directed by Clio Barnard and it's set in, in the north of England. And it's a love yes, affair I, yeah, I know the f between a white woman and an Asian man yeah. in Bradford. And it, it was a really, a really wonderful film and we were so lucky because the, one of the features of this is that we always try to get somebody from the film and we were so lucky there because Clio Barnard came and two main actors came. The point is really to have a dialogue between psychoanalysis and film. It's not to take a sort of superior stance. It's, it's very much to, to, to bring these two disciplines together and have a conversation. And so we always want to have a filmmaker or an actor as well, or a critic, something like that. And it's open to the general public, isn't yes. it? 
Yes, And you would is. like students to attend? Very much. Are you going to give them a discount? Yes. <laughs> no, well, that's well, no, sure, a big sure. issue. Yeah, well, absolutely. it is a, it is a really big issue. Yeah. I, I, I agree. We really want it to be as open and inclusive as possible because it's, it's about having a debate with all sorts of different people. And most of us go to the movies, so, so it's nice to, to, to include yes. people. Mm. And also it might be a, a, a really helpful way for, for people to get into psychoanalysis and to mm. think about it. So, but I think that it, it is important too that, you know, right at the beginning of the relationship between psychoanalysis and cinema, I think there was a tendency maybe to, to do kind of wild analysis. Because after all, there's a question. If all of our psychoanalytic knowledge comes from this very kind of closed, confidential dyad, the analyst, the patient, the couch, the session, how on earth can you approach something like a film or any kind of cultural product in that way? Because, you know, you're not going to put the film on the... You can't put the film on the couch. You're not going to put the director on the couch. You can't assume anything well, unless about the director's it. name is Woody Allen. Well, <laughs> puts himself on the couch. Although, That's in it. fact, there is some brilliant... I mean, there is a bit in Annie Hall that I mm. absolutely love and have used in teaching where he kind of... in the, the She has come back from her first session ever. To, to, of course, he's recommended that she needs to have an analysis. You know, he's very well experienced in that, obviously. And, and so she comes and she recounts this first session. And in one take, he kind of goes through all the major tropes, you know, of Freudian <laughs> metapsychology. And I think it's brilliant, you know, the Oedipus complex, the unconscious, you know, the relationship, oh, dreams, all, all of that, unconscious fantasies, murderous aggression, sexuality, <laughs> does a lot. <laughs> We're coming to the end of our time. Stuart, do you have any more questions for Anne? Oh, I've got thousands more questions for Anne, but we'll have to postpone those and get Anne back some other time, otherwise we're going to be a long for time. For the episode on psychoanalysis part two. two. Yeah, definitely. <laughs> and is there anything you want to add or that you think listeners would find interesting that, about psychoanalysis? Well, I think psychoanalysis has always been a discipline that sort of teeters on, on the edge of popularity. It's never going to be the big th main thing. I think the reason that psychoanalysis is often unpopular is because it's subversive. Because what it's doing is, is really um, trying to explore the unconscious, or the unconscious drives, whether they're aggressive, sexual, they're disruptive. And I think that's why, in order for psychoanalysis to be true to itself, it's always going to be a bit on the edge, because it has to remain subversive if it's going to have any chance of success. It's been great talking to you, and I hope uh, everybody else found it as fascinating as I did. Thanks, and goodbye from me. And goodbye from me, and thanks, Anne. That's Thank you very much, and goodbye from me.